Now, so we've been talking a lot about all the different capabilities of technology to really get your business f launched and flying through the door and gaining some competitive uh, advantage over your competitors. Um, what I want to do today is take a look at a specific type of technology. So some of this discussion is going to be a bit more technical, but I really, what I want you to take away from this is the potential for business and what it can do. Um, and I think the the, the, the case at the very beginning, the one, the gear up um, case, really, I think, captures an important, really important uh, trend that's going on within the industry that I think is, everyone should be aware of. And it's something called cloud computing. So, and as the case talks about, the gear up is, you know, trying to cut costs. You know, their, their goal is to compete competitively on price. So they're trying to keep their prices down. But their web hosting is one price that keeps, or one cost that keeps going up and up and up. Well, Lucas, one of the uh, IT guys, suggests provisioning web servers and databases in the cloud. Now, if you don't know what the cloud is yet, that's fine. I mean, that, and apparently, in the case, a lot of the people he, Lucas was talking to had no clue what the cloud means. They may have heard the term, but they're like, what, what the heck are they talking about? But Here's the important takeaway. When you put your stuff, uh, your computing, in the cloud, you stop having to buy all the hardware yourself and you basically end up renting everything. So instead of having to buy a, you know, a $5,000 server, you can rent a server or server space for, let's say, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be different for each individual company you work or you um, contract with, but let's say it's fifty dollars a month plus twenty five cents per hour for processing time used. That's it. Now, so five thousand dollars or fifty dollars a month plus a few uh, extra dollars per month for the processing time. Now, there is some huge potential for savings here, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But if you don't understand how networks work then this entire discussion about the cloud would be completely lost on you. Now this is something I struggle with on a personal basis when I deal with my mother-in-law. And she's always requesting, you know, when I, I came over to help set up her home network, and she said, well, my, network's, my, my Netflix isn't working. Well, the fact of the matter is networks was, uh, Netflix was working fine. It was actually her network that was not working correctly. And so I was able to identify where the problem was, even though she didn't understand how all these technologies work together. She's pretty clueless on that. And there's a lot of people out there who are like that. If you know at least a little bit about how these things work and come together, you have a lot more power in communicating, communicating with people and figuring out how to solve your own problems. So the things we want to cover in Chapter 6 are, what is a computer network? So a basic general definition. And we're going to look at what are the components of a local area network, also pronounced or is called a LAN, L-A-N. Question three is going to look at what are the fundamental concepts you should know about the Internet. And then question four, what processing occurs on a typical web server. Question five, why is the cloud the future for most organizations? Now, I'm going to do something a little different this time. I'm going to switch up questions one and two. Uh, even though the book starts with question one, we're going to start with question two to give you a little bit more grounding in the vocabulary and some examples. All right, so question two, what are the components of a LAN? Well, if you look at your own home network, and I encourage you all to do this, if you have a home network, go sit down and try to figure this out. All right. Uh, some of this won't be too incredibly diff difficult to do. Now, you probably have some sort of device, usually called a router, that allows all the computers to connect together. Now, this router might have wires going to your computer, or it might all be wire wireless. Okay, um, You probably have a printer hooked up somewhere. Again, the printer might be wired, but then again, it might be wireless. 
So that middle box there is your router. And it has various different pieces of functionality that it can handle. Um, and then there's also an outbound cable that usually goes to something like, uh, usually goes to a modem, and then your modem is what connects you to the internet. So that modem might be a cable modem, it might be a DSL modem. Um, I don't believe anyone in this area would have a fiber optic modem, but that could be a potential uh, one as well. So to talk a little bit more about this, I went ahead and sketched up my own home office network. So it's kind of a crude diagram again, um, but I have a router and it has four wired ports. So I can put up to four wired, two, four wires into it. Now right now I only have one thing that's actually wired to that, and that's my work computer. Um, but my work computer is actually the Lenovo Helix. And what's nice about it is I can plug it in and it'll, it'll to a docking station. My docking station has monitors and um, mics and all kinds of fancy stuff. So I can wire it or it works wirelessly as well. So if I unplug from my docking station, which is wired to the router, then it starts working wirelessly. And then I can carry it around anywhere in the house and still continue to work. However, oftentimes, if I, especially if I have a large chunk of work to get done, I want to sit at my desk I want it to, and I can close my door so there's less noise. Um, I plug it in, I get nice big monitors when I do that. And so it works out quite well to be able to do that. And I get a little bit faster speed when it's wired. If you're wireless, it's a little bit slower speed. Um, not terribly so, but it is a little slower. But everything else in my house is hooked up wirelessly. And you can see all the devices now I have at, at my house. So we also have another home computer we have a Nook, we have an iPad, an iPhone, and a Windows phone. And then we have four entertainment devices. So we have a smart TV, which I, we just bought this past Christmas. Um, we have an Apple TV, which a friend just sent to me recently as well. We have an Xbox, which hooks up to the internet, and a Blu-ray player that hooks up to the internet. And now my printer isn't actually hooked up to the internet, but it is hooked up to our um, to the router so that all my computer, all my computing devices, so my home computer, my work computer, my Nook, my iPad, um, I haven't tried it with my Windows phone yet, but it probably could print to the printer. And so right now, you can see I have 11 devices that are hooked up to the internet. So, and this is a fun little thing that we can do. Sit down and count all the different devices that you now have hooked up that can connect to the, I'm sorry, the printer doesn't hook to the internet. So there's really only 10 devices that hook up to the internet. Um, and that's currently. Uh, you know, if you had caught me two months ago, I had my mother-in-law living with me for uh, an extended period of time, and she had her own four devices too. So multiply, you know, add four more onto that. Um, so, you know, do this, okay? And, and what's interesting is just how many homes now easily have over, you know, have a five, six, seven devices that are hooked up to the internet, usually through your router. Uh, and even if it's not, so some people might have a phone um, that isn't, that doesn't use your Wi-Fi network, okay? So I can turn that off. I can turn on my Windows phone, I can turn off my, um, Wi-Fi connectivity and then suddenly it's using what's called 3G which connects through a different um, network. So at any rate this is my current home office diagram. All right? So three common alternatives for creating a um, for creating your internet or your uh, small your home office internet. Well, usually you're, you're going to create some sort of local area network. And this is, again, can be done with wired or wireless connectivity. You need some sort of line if you're using a wired one, or if it's wireless. Um, you have different levels of transmission speeds, different equipment that might be used different protocols that are used. Um, but at the end of the day, the important thing is they have to all be able to connect. And 
and be secure when you're doing that connection as well. All right, now how do you connect all that to the internet? All right, so there's three main ways, uh, at least today, and, there, and hopefully we'll get more competition in this area in the not too distant future. But basically you have your cable companies and your phone companies are the two competing ways of doing it. Uh, if you're using your phone company, you'll be using DSL, which is the broadband. Now, it may be possible to still use, uh, you know, the the old-fashioned modem. Um, and I don't even know if they have a specific name for it, other than calling it uh, the narrowband um, connectivity. But so few people do that anymore. We don't even list that because uh, it's, it's not really even hardly worth talking about. Um, but DSL does run through the telephone wire. It uh, does give you fairly decent up, uh, upload speeds and download speeds. You do need a DSL modem to make that happen and a, and a subscription with the telephone company. A cable modem is very similar except it's hosted by the cable company and usually comes in through a what's called a coaxial cable. Um, Similar speeds as the DSL, might be slightly faster, but equipment used, you need a cable modem and sometimes a cable TV box. Um, all that, the cable TV box is pretty rare now. Um, but you can also connect through a wide area network. That's what a WAN stands for, wide area network wireless connectivity. Now, an example of this, and I've seen my, a buddy of mine do this, is a device that will actually allow your computers to hook up to the telephone system, right? So that's basically a wide area network. Um, you know, the cell phone capabilities reaches everywhere. So what they do is they take a device, um, and he has this little device that's about four inches by four inches. He can put it on. He can basically, and he did this once when I was driving him somewhere. He put it on the on the dashboard and. Suddenly, his little computer had network connectivity because the device connected the cell phone network to his wireless network, local area net, uh, wireless net, network. Um, and some people are doing this with their cell phones. They're just saying, well, you know what? Um, why pay DSL and cable? I already have a mobile phone. What, I'm already using that service. Why don't I just combine all that service together and give myself a wide area network um, wireless connectivity to the Internet? Okay, um, so there's a lot of different capabilities here. So, so we're talking a lot about all these. What are these network stuff, right? So I'm giving you some examples of what's going on here. What is a network? Well, a network is, in the very simplest definition, would be two or more computers that are connected together, a computer network, right? Um, so that they can communicate with each other. Now, computers don't communicate in the same way humans do, obviously. They send electrical signals back and forth, usually in the, you know, um, as ones and zeros. Um, but they can also share with this passing of information, um, which can include things like sharing software, uh, peripheral devices, like a mouse or a keyboard or a monitor, um, and or processing power. So in some computer networks, you'll find that two computers are talking together and, and some will do some processing, some will do other processing, but they share the load. So again, this can be as simple as having two computers hooked together. And some of the first networks were designed like that. Now it's kind of rare today to have a network like that. But it can happen. So what are the basic principles of a network? Number one, each computer must have a way to interface with the other computers, which allows it to send and receive information. And we'll talk a little bit about how they can do this interface. There's, um, but there must be some way they can connect, right? Some device, usually. Some device that allows them to do this connection. All right, two, the network usually has at least one connecting device, such as a hub, switch, or router. So a network, now it is possible to connect two computers together directly, but it's rare. 
usually you have some device that allows you to put multiple computers together, but they all connect to the device and then the device then. So then when you connect with another computer, you're connecting through this extra device to get there. So that's typical. You know, probably 99.9999% of the time you have some device in there. All right, a network must have communications media to transport information. Basically meaning there has to be some means of getting the information from one point to another. It doesn't just magically get there. There has to be some, either a physical wire or radio waves that are being sent that the sending from your computer to the device and from the device to whatever we're going to next. But there's got to be some means of transmitting that information. And four, each computer must have software or move, I'm sorry, not or move, to move information in and out of the computer. Again, so if you think of what is software, it's basically a set of rules or procedures. And so if you're sending information, it has to know where it's coming from, where it's going to, and it has to be defined by a specific set of procedures or rules for how to do that. Again, this is not magic. This information doesn't move magically, right? Something has to tell it what to do. And if that thing telling it what to do for some reason doesn't tell it right, then you have a problem, right? But let's break this down a little bit and talk about each one of these. So the first one, a network interface. So what, what do you put on a computer to make that happen? Well, it starts with something called the network interface card, right? Um, now, and then there's a little picture of one down at the bottom. This is what you might have seen on a desktop, or you still can see on many desktops, is the network interface card. Now, today a lot of newer devices have this built in. So if you see what's called an Ethernet port, and that's the little black, so if you look at that card down below and there's that silver on the side, uh, that's the part that sticks out, that's visible, and there's a hole there for the Ethernet for Ethernet cable, which is a little bit bigger than a phone jack, if any of you know, even know what a phone jack looks like anymore. Um, so a lot of this uh, stuff isn't even being used, but, but basically a network interface card takes the information on your computer and puts it into a format that f allows for transmission via a cable or sometimes even radio frequencies. So if you're doing a wireless, so you can have a wireless network interface card, which wouldn't have this Ethernet port on here, but might have an antenna that allows to transmit information and collect it. Now, this Ethernet card, it says it's the most uh, common type of network interface card. That is only partially true. Now, I think, especially on all, mo a lot of new devices, it's becoming less and less common. What's more and more common is a wireless network interface card. Especially with all the new tablets coming out. And a lot of them just don't have this Ethernet port on it. All right, we said we needed software, right? I think that was number four of our list of things. So there's got to be, a, a, when communicating with both computers, operating systems, and then and the network interface card, you need some sort of so network software. And this can be built into the operating system itself, and oftentimes is. But it provides the tools for managing the transmission of information, including things like security, or managing the traffic. So what's important, what's, uh, what, what is allowed and what isn't on the network. Or the device, and we'll talk about the different network components and devices that can hook up a network. They have their own set of software on them to do its own set of you know, distinct um, capabilities. Right? But keep this in mind, right? So there is software, a set of instructions and rules that define how this information, so like if I'm going to a, a web page from my browser, there has to be a way when I click on a link that that link is then sent out 
of my computer through a wire or th wirelessly to a component that will allow me to connect to the internet and then once I'm on the internet it has to go through a whole set of other devices to finally get, find the information out there on the internet and bring it back in such a way that it can display on my screen. All right, so there's a heck of a lot of stuff going on in this process. All right, so, so what are some of the devices that go into networks? Well, one common one is called a hub, and this is basically a device that connects computers into, ne into a network and repeats all transmissions to every connected computer. What does that mean? Well, basically, and, and this was far more popular, you know, 10 years ago to have hubs. Um, but you would have, you know, maybe four computers and you would plug them all into your hub. And once they're all plugged in, when you send a signal from one computer to, the other, and to another computer, basically what would happen is you would send all the information, would go to the hub. The hub wasn't that smart. So all it would do is say, well, I see this signal coming from um, port the third port, I'm going to send it to one, two, and four. I don't know which one's right, but the one at the end will be able to tell based upon um, the instructions. So he sends it to one, two, and four. All three of the computers at the other end receive it, but only one of them processes it and does anything with it. That's essentially what a hub can do. Now, a switch is a little bit smarter than that. It's a device that connects computers, repeats transmissions, just like a hub did, but it sends it only to the intended recipient. So it's got a little bit more processing power on the device itself, but it reduces the amount of total um, information being sent to each of the computers at the end. So it can manage multiple conversations, um, can occur simultaneously between different computer sets, only recipients, recipient computers see each message, so you can see it's going to be a slightly more secure. And computers can still broadcast messages to all other computers on the network if that need be. Now probably one of the more advanced ones is something called a router, which is a device that connects sub-networks of a larger network. So in the case of you know, your home router, essentially what you're connecting together is your wired network and your wireless network and it connects you to the internet so it's actually connecting together three sub networks now what gets confusing is that a lot of computers I'm sorry a lot of devices today combine elements of the hub switch and router so like my router at home is actually a, you know I don't even know if it's a hub or a switch but also combined with a router technology um, and this is very, very common. And usually we refer to the most complex technology built into it, so that's why we call them routers. But they also have the capabilities of a switch or hub built in. So we've talked a lot about the local area network. This is where they all, basically all the computers sit in the same physical site. So if you would walk into like a single office building, they would probably have all the computers on one local area network. Or on campus, here at ECU, we have labs. And in the lab, all the computers are on a single local area network. But let's say we wanted to connect up my, uh, you know, the lab computer with here in Bait Building with a lab computer over in... Uh, the medical center. Well now you need something called a wide area network. And these are computers connected between two or more separate sites. So it doesn't have to be even around the world. You can have global area networks, but these can just be, you know, maybe a mile away, maybe even, you know, a hundred feet away the buildings are, but you're on different locations, so you got two different networks that they're on. But you still want them to be able to communicate with each other so you create something called a wide area network. Now there's slightly more sophisticated technology that goes into building a wide area network. I am not going to get into that and mostly because you guys this it, it won't matter to you. This is the it tends to get far more technical than what most business people even care about.
But just know that you know when people refer to the WAN or the wide area network, that's what they're basically saying. They're saying we're, t we're connected these computer networks together um, from different locations. Now the internet, oh yes, the internet. The internet, the best way of, the, the, probably the shortest and most concise definition of the internet is that it is a network of networks. Now so this is an important definition. It's a network of networks. So basically, they use a specific set of standard ways of communicating with each other. And you have a lot of networks that connect together using this standard form of communication. And because of that, we can share information across these different networks. But the internet is just one big network, ginormous, the biggest network. There is only one internet. And so, in fact, this um, table here in the book, it says the internet and internets is a bit misleading. I think it should say intranets, um, which would mean internal networks within a uh, business that uses the internet technology. Um, and we're not going to dig too much into that in this specific lecture because I'm actually going to give you a resource where you can learn a lot more about it outside of this uh, lecture. Um, but the internet is more than just a world wide web. It's more than just email. There's actually a lot more to it. Um, now the one you're most used to though or the most familiar with would be accessing web pages and most likely email. Right? Both of those use the internet to connect. But you also saw some of the examples of things that I have connected to the internet, such as my Xbox. Right? Now my Xbox connects to the internet. It's not showing web pages. In fact, I don't even know if it has the capabilities to show web pages on it. I don't think it has a browser to look at web pages. And yet it's still connected to the internet and still communicates with other computers using internet technologies. So what are the fundamental concepts you should know about the internet? Well, number one, realize again, what we have are a bunch of uh, networks that are connected together. Now the internet, when especially in diagramming the internet, and this is what even a lot of business profession or a lot of IT professionals will use. Oh, excuse me, I have to, got a little tickle in my nose and it's making it hard to talk. Um, so when we're talking about the internet, you're actually talking about a whole lot of different things going on. But the truth of the matter is from a networking perspective, you don't necessarily know what's out there because it can be changing. You don't have control over that technology. All you have control over is your own specific network. But you know you're connecting to something out there. And so it started to become a traditional notation to refer to the internet as the cloud. And you'll see why this is important when we start talking about cloud computing. But it's often notated in diagrams as a big cloud, a big fluffy cloud, and basically saying that there's a lot of stuff that's going through it. We don't know what, but we know it's information's being passed through there. That's not saying that somebody doesn't know somewhere, it just means you don't know, nor does it really matter all that much to you, as long as you get your information in a timely manner over this giant network. So what makes the internet the internet? Well, and in the book to describe a little bit about this, and I'm also going to give you a resource that can tell you more in details beyond what the book does, but that basically it came down to a protocol called TCP IP. Now the TCP part stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and it explains how information is transmitted using internet technologies. The IP stands for Internet Protocol. And essentially, the IP means that every computer that's hooked up, or any device, not just computer, so let's say every device that's hooked up to the Internet must have an IP address. It must have an IP address. 
So that means your computer at home, it means your the you know work computer, it means your um, even computers with web pages. Um, so if you're going to go to a website that has a bunch of web pages on it, that computer has to have an IP address, and that's how you can get to that computer and get look at the web pages. Every single computer on the internet must have an IP address to reference it. Now, when you go to a web page, and this is an important differentiation here, most of you don't know what the IP address is. And that's because when the people first developed the internet, they realized while it's easy to identify things with numbers, it's hard to remember a bunch of numbers. Just like it's kind of hard to remember a whole bunch of phone numbers, right? You know, if you were to ask me, how many phone numbers do I know? I would say four. That's it, I know four. I know my own phone number. I know for my cell phone. I know my work phone number for my office. I know my wife's phone number. And I know my parents' phone number. All the other ones I look up, right? And how do I look them up? Well, if I have my phone handy, I look up the phone number by looking up the people's names. Well, the same thing kind of happened with the internet. It was too hard to remember all the IP addresses, all these uh, numbers that reference computers. So what they did is they started making up names for the server where the information was. So all Google.com does, so if you type in Google.com into your browser, the Google.com just says, when you type it into your browser, it looks for the IP number associated with that domain name. Because those are called, Google.com is a domain name. And so it's a name, and you just look up a number associated with the name, you go to that number, you find the Google web page, and it brings it back to the browser. And how does it get that information from one location to another? It does it through this cloud of technology. So there's lots of technology going on in there. There's several routers and gateways and wires, different types of wires, different types of way of passing information over a vast uh, distances before it shows up in your specific browser. So you want to learn more about this, go watch my lecture, uh, lecture on internet uh, architecture um, on YouTube where I break it down in more details. And if you want to learn even more about internet technologies, I have a whole series on e-commerce and some of those get into um, what are the processing occurs on the typical web server, um, which is our question number four. Um, I'm not linking to it here because for me that's not the most important thing for you to spend your time on researching. There are some useful things to um, do read the chapter and the section of the book on that, but it's not anything that I can really talk about meaningfully in a lecture like this. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead to question five because to me, this is where kind of the rubber hits the road for a lot of you guys, which is understanding the future of networks. Now, so we talked a little bit about what the, what the cloud is. So the cloud is essentially all of these resources on the internet. So there's a lot of things connected to the internet. Um, and it really became, and this is probably a good way of looking at it. Um, you know, back in, uh, I don't know the exact year, shoot, um, but about five to ten years ago, Amazon.com, you know, they started realizing that every Christmas season, they had to increase the number of computers they had to use for making sales through their website. Right? So they had to increase the number of computers they were using. But after the Christmas season was over, some of these computers that they had been using are now sitting idle doing nothing. Right? Because they don't have the same volume, the same number of people trying to make transactions all the time. So while you needed it during the Christmas season, afterwards, 
you know, they're just sitting there. And so Amazon basically asked this question. Okay, we have all these computers that we've purchased um, that are now doing nothing. Is there any way we can make money well off of these? And I said, well, yeah. Why can't we just rent it out? And so they developed a software that would allow them to um, rent the access to their computing resources so other people could basically rent these computers. And so now they could rent out the computers that weren't being used for nine months out of the year. So maybe from you know, February up to October. Now because they were renting this out, they were making enough money that not only paid for the cost of these computers uh, to maintain and run them, but also to buy new computers for the next uh, season, Christmas season. And so they developed this business model where they can continually increase their computing resources and having other people help pay for it, which is bloody brilliant if you ask me. Um, so what is the cloud? Well, cloud computing is really about renting out computing resources but doing it through the internet. And it's supposed to be very elastic. What does that mean? Um, it means that you can use the resources, you can increase or decrease the amount of resources you need using programs and software. You can do it very, very quickly. And so then you can only pay, you would only have to pay for the resources that you used. Sounds pretty cool, right? You only pay for the resources that, that you use. So why buy a computer? And now think about this. You know, how many of you own a computer that sits at home? How much is it used at night when you're asleep? I mean, seriously, how often? You know, how often is your computer sitting idle doing nothing? Doing nothing. Right? So you bought this resource and maybe 90% of the day it's just sitting there doing nothing. Well, a lot of businesses realize this too and they said, well, people are buying a lot of computers that are just sitting there doing nothing. We can rent you the resources you need and then you're not paying for nothing, you're paying for only what you use. And it has some other additional benefits as well. Now, when I started going, started looking at this chart uh, that was listed in the book, it, honestly, they, they gloss over a lot of problems and some potentials for versus doing cloud-based hosting versus uh, in-house hosting. Um, so they kind of whitewash this a little bit. Uh, there, I think, is a lot of value to cloud-based computing, but um, it, they, they did a really poor job of looking at the, at the big picture. Um, but here are some positives for doing cloud-based hosting. It includes small capital requirements, very speedy development, and that may be iffy, um, but, you know, whatever. Uh, superior flexibility and adaptability to growing or fluctuating demand, and that is very important for a lot of businesses, especially smaller businesses who may see a lot more flexibility and cannot adapt uh, over long periods of time. Uh, it has a very known cost structure, so you know how much you'll pay per you know, uh, processing unit that you use. Possibly has the best of breed security and disaster preparedness. Now, this depends on the company you're working with. You know, you got to hope that they have the best of breed. Um, you got to do your research first. There's no obsolescence. So in other words, after you buy and start using something, it doesn't become obsolete because if you're renting it, they can automatically upgrade it as you're going. So, you know, like if you go out and buy Office 2010 and then three years they come out with Office 2013, guess what? You have to upgrade, All right? Otherwise, you'll be using obsolete software. Well, with cloud-based hosting, you can overcome that. And then there's industry-wide economies of scale and hence tend to be cheaper. Now, what are some positives for in-house hosting? Well, they can include a greater control of your data, like where it's located, have a much greater in-depth visibility of security and disaster preparedness. All right, but they missed a couple things too, such as invested capital stays with the company. Otherwise, every time you know, money goes out the door, it's gone, and you never see it again. 
You also have much greater flexibility with how to use the servers. You know, and I saw this recently um, with a you know um, in development of a piece of software that was going to be used, and they wanted to have email functionality included. Well, there were some problems with how the email was the email server was working, so that it could only send out a few emails at a time um, before it caused a problem. Now, if this was something that you built in house, you wouldn't have this limitation. But because it was a cloud-based solution. They were limited by the number of emails they could send out at any given time. Again, and this is this a case where the textbook was kind of whitewashing the whole cloud-based computing thing and missed some major advantages of in-house hosting. Um, the same thing with the negatives, right? So some problems with cloud-based hosting include dependency on the vendor, um, loss of control over your data location, little visibility into true security and the disaster preparedness capabilities, you know, and they can make promises, but when especially something like disaster preparedness, you won't know if the disaster preparedness is really what they say it was until a disaster happens, and then it might be too late. Um, In-house hosting, though, does also have a significant um, problems including significant capital up front so yes yes that capital stays with you but you still have to spend it um, it's usually there's significant development effort annual maintenance costs ongoing support costs staff and trained personnel increased management requirements because you not only have to manage the your users but you also have to manage the IT staff can be difficult or even impossible to accommodate fluctuating demand so if you suddenly have a great increase in demand of your technology, can you meet it? There can be some cost uncertainties, especially if a, like if a server, a server breaks down, you got to run out and buy a new one, and things become obsolete. Now that being said, there's also some negatives that I think the book missed on cloud-based computing, because it's interesting that they talk about the you know the costs of in-house hosting and, and completely ignore ongoing expenses of cloud-based hosting. I mean, it's just inappropriate to do that um, if you're going to do a true balanced look at them. You also have less flexibility in the use of systems. And this is partly due to the dependency on the vendor, uh, but a dependency on their um, technology and what they have available. And you might also experience increased switching costs. So yes, you might have a vendor, but switching to a new vendor may be difficult so you get kind of locked in and that can be a major negative if you start having problems with your vendor so this all sounds really freaking awesome so a big question is why did it take so long for this stuff to come about and the answer is well no actually they did have some of this beforehand um, back in the 60s there was a big push for doing basically renting mainframe space so the big mainframes, the million dollar computers, because a lot of, it's the same idea, you know, we have these mainframes, every second they're sitting idle, we're wasting thousands of dollars, so why don't we try renting this out so it's not a big drain on us, but also gives capabilities to a lot of smaller people around us. And there was some potential to it, but the technology at the time wasn't quite robust enough to manage it well. And we saw that there was a huge boom in the 1960s with technology suddenly become ex extremely cheap. Now, it's always been on a downward trend. But with the advent of mini computers and then PC computers, the mainframe became far less of this unique computing situation that existed back in the 50s and early 60s. Today, however, it's not just the fact that we have technology out there that's cheap and easy to use, but we also have software that can actually manage it well. And we have technology that allows the communication across vast different distances so that we can have access to this technology. So it's a combination of things that now have made it feasible to do cloud computing. 
which includes, you know, having the processors, the data commission, the data storage at nearly a free price, especially compared to where it was 20 years ago. And we have like web farms providing virtual machines. And you're probably thinking, what the heck is a virtual machine? Well, essentially, we've got this sophisticated technology that can make a computer work across several pieces. So the, the software basically hides the hardware underneath so that you can actually have two pieces of hardware, two servers, but the technology will make it look like one server. Or vice versa, you might have one piece of hardware, but the software will make it look like there's 10 different pieces of, 10 pieces of hardware underneath. And that's how sophisticated our software is getting. Um, and that's where the idea of a virtual machine comes from, is that it's virtual because it's no longer one physical object that you're necessarily using. It could be a series of objects that are combined together using some sophisticated software, um, but it, it can be done at such a cheap rate, as, as little as one and a half cents per hour um, of you know for you to pay and rent to use that and create your website and host it online. Really freaking amazing stuff. When does it not make sense to use this? Well, um, there's a, you can often find when there's laws or industry standard practices require physical control of the data. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, like, for example, here at ECU, we're limited by a law called FERPA, which prevents uh, us to, from using a number of cloud-based computing solutions, including, you know, I, I, for one, love using Dropbox to store a lot of my documents. But Dropbox is not approved by the university because the security... Um, because ECU cannot control the security on Dropbox, I am not supposed to put any student data on that technology. Now, it doesn't say I can't put syllabuses up there, but I can't put any grades of students or any assignments. I can't put those up on Dropbox. Okay, so there's a law there that says I'm not allowed to do that. You also find in some industries, um, like I was talking to a gentleman in the uh, insurance industry, and he said we don't have... Um, any cloud products and we don't really plan on using any in the near future in part because we need that control over our data so the industry standard is basically that no we're not going to share anything on the cloud now there is the option also to do something called a private cloud and this is usually only applicable when you have a really big business that can essentially duplicate the cloud computing environment but put it all internally to the business And so by, you know, a really big business that has, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 employees in multiple different, um, you know, functions of the business, you can essentially duplicate this capabilities. All right. So how can you actually use the cloud? Well, there's three major ways or types of cloud computing that's currently done. The first one is something called software as a service. Now, I've already introduced you to the one for this class called Office 365, right? And this is where you can actually rent Microsoft Office. That's right, rent it. You don't have to buy it. You can rent it. And um, I don't know the cost structure for home environment. I guess it depends on how sophisticated one. I want to say it's around $7 a month, right? Um, and so for a year, that might give you a slight discount, so it might be $70 or so for the year versus going out and buying the product new, which might cost you 150 to $200. Um, but you don't have to upgrade, right? Uh, so the next time, the next version of Office that comes out will be automatically rolled into Office 365. Um, another version might be iCloud, which is Apple's uh, cloud computing service that allows you to upload your music and your music, I'm sorry, your music and your videos and your photos and access it from different devices. 
Uh, another popular one that marketing people might be interested in is something called Salesforce.com. Right? So it's a piece of software. It's basically a website, but it has a lot of sophisticated capabilities to it that allows you to run your Salesforce from the site. And you have basically you have logins for various people. They all can log in to this application, do the work they need to do, store all the information they need to store. But you don't actually have to buy the software um, to install on local computers. It's all on the web. And so you're especially, you know, when you're dealing with a lot of salespeople, a lot of times they're traveling. And so now they can access the software anywhere they're at, even if they don't bring their computer with them. All right, secondary type is something called a platform as a surface, uh, service. It includes things like Microsoft Azure, Oracle On Demand. Um, it gives you the capabilities to do development of software. So it's not just the raw hardware technology. Uh, they usually have some capabilities built into it so you can do some more sophisticated development. Um, but the raw kind, where it's just basically raw processing power, is called an infrastructure as a service. And now Amazon does this and does it very well with their Elastic Cloud or the simple storage services. Um, now, when you work with something like Dropbox, you might say, well, where does Dropbox fit into this category? Um, is it an infrastructure or is it software as a service? And it's kind of, you know, and that's kind of a good question. You really can't do any development with it, but it's not the raw infrastructure. Even though you're basically storing stuff on the web, it's really more software based because it also includes the syncing technology to put um, copies on your local computer. So I would actually categorize that one, Dropbox as a software as a service. What about the, you know, um, well I think everyone also has their pirate drive here at ECU. Is the pirate drive cloud computing? Now this is a, a, probably a mit, bit more of a technical question which I don't even know the answer to. But the, it would really depend on, is the pirate drive managed with internet technologies? So there might be other technologies that you're using that are not internet based that allow you to access the pirate drive. And then if, if it is internet based, then yes, it is an infrastructure as a service because it's basically just the raw storage with no fancy software attached. If they don't use internet technologies, then it's not cloud-based computing. And so, the, so that hopefully this can give you a little bit of an idea of where cloud computing is going now. Um, and what we find is that a lot of companies are making a big push into software as a service, uh, platform as a service, or infrastructure as a service, because they want the ongoing um, and so one, one major worry that companies have, like especially like a company like uh, Microsoft, is that people are going to stop wanting to use their software. If they can get you to start renting it to them, one, it creates a better cro uh, cost structure for them. So whenever Microsoft releases a new piece of software like Office 2013, there's usually a major uh, increase in the number of sales for the first six months and then it tapers off. Well, that's a little bit harder to manage as a company when you have this big, um, you know, a whole bunch of money that floods into the company. But then what do you do when the sales, you know, over time drop off? How do you keep on going, keep the, uh, you know, the business function going? How do you keep paying your employees? And yes, you might have saved a lot of that money, but then again, you may have spent it on other things. And so you might run out of money. With this type of cost structure, where you're offering things as a service, you get paid on an ongoing basis. And so it allows you to ramp up your company over time and incre increase the cash flow over time. And that is a nice, powerful thing for a lot of the tech companies, why they want you to do it. For a lot of businesses, why do they want to do it? Well, for the reasons we already talked about, right? Because it does give a lot of capabilities for businesses to grow and to deal with flexibility. So understanding how this all works. So if someone were to say, all right, we want to have a virtualized machine um, as a, 
in a cloud environment. What are they talking about? Well, what they're saying is they want the capabilities of renting the infrastructure as they need it. And as you use more and more of that infrastructure, you pay more and more. But hopefully by that time, you have the capabilities to, you know, especially if you're making money off of these increased resources, the more resources you use, the more money you're making, and you can easily pay for it. And so it allows you as a company to manage growth much easier. And that is a powerful, powerful thing. Versus, you know, what happens if you want to grow a business and you have to buy property or buy a building, build buildings. Um, you know, those are huge capital expenses that can sometimes be very difficult to manage it, the company as it grows. So at any rate, here's our review. Um, what is a computer network? Well, it's any connections between different computers or computing devices. And that can be a quite a wide variety of devices including like and I showed in my home network um, which included things like uh, my Apple TV, my smart TV, my Xbox, my printer, all these are devices that are now connected to my home network. And they are connected, that home network is something called a local area network or also pronounced LAN. And that includes different components um, the physical devices such as hubs and routers and switches and it also includes software for letting the network communication to occur and includes a medium by which the information is passed whether it's through a wire or through wireless radio signals now one particular way of communicating is using internet technologies. In particular, I mentioned TCP IP. And TCP IP is basically the technology that allows the internet to run as we know it today, which includes the browser, includes our email, but also includes a host of other activities, including you know, voice over IP, which allows you to make Skype calls. It allows you to uh, do Google Hangouts. Um, there's also technology that allows you to send information for computer games. It allows you to send information for Netflix. And what processing occurs on a typical web server? Well, a whole host of things, but we're not going to get into a lot of those details. Um, but essentially what they allow you to do is to access web pages and return those pages back to the, to the user who's browsing. And why is the cloud the future of the, of, for most organizations? Well, because of the increased flexibility that is available from this new technology and the ability to stay, keep current with the most recent advances in that technology. Well, that was quite the mouthful. Um, hope you all have found this just a bit um, inspiring and hopefully useful in understanding how data communications are taking place and particularly how the cloud is helping to push this technology forward. That's all for today.